up next, the topic is going to be monitoring remote locations with Nagios. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for John Sellens. You know, I'm looking at the clock up here because he was kind enough. There's a clock. So I can look and say, oh, crap, I'm late. <laughs> but I think it's a, I don't know if everybody's here yet or if people are scrambling for coffee or whatever. So I'll give a quick introduction. Um, I've been using Nagios for a long time. The first time I actually installed it, I was doing a, a talk the next day on SNMP, and I'm sitting in my hotel room, and this was probably 99 or 2000 or something like that. And I say, oh, well, I've heard about this NetSync thing. Maybe I should, you know, fire it up and see what happens. And so I ran FreeBSD on my laptop, of course, because that's what all good people do. And uh, I went to the ports director. I said, you know, make install NetSync. And poof, it fired it up. And it made sure that Apache was running and things like that. And I, I went to the, you know, it installed the sample config files. And I went to the web interface. And, and there was information there. And all I had to do was type make install. And I thought, this is a good thing. So I've been hooked ever since. Uh, I've been talking about Nagios in various places, probably, what the hell year is it? I don't know, eight or nine years, one way or another. So hopefully, I have some vague idea of what I'm talking about. But uh, we shall see what happens this morning. I've been a sysadmin for a very long time. Uh, I currently work at FreshBooks in Toronto. That's the plug, because they're letting me be here this week. So if you need to do invoicing, go to FreshBooks. Uh, this morning, yeah. so what I'm going to show you is there's more than one way to do it. And I stole that from the Perl people. And I'm not necessarily a fan of that in programming languages. But in Nagios and in systems administration, sometimes it's a good thing to be able to do. So I'm going to set the scene. We're going to. Picture, if you will, a network. Um, a, a lot of times, you know, we may be looking at just one area. We may have an office. We're looking at the machines and servers that are sitting in that office. Everything's on the same network. Everything's in the same security zone. We're behind the same firewall. And you can get any place from any other place. And when you're monitoring an area like that, that's fairly straightforward. But if you have machines out in a co-location facility, or if you've got Amazon machines, or you've got Linodes, or you've got multiple locations or things like that, you'll usually have some sort of barrier between you and that place. Now, in some situations, you might set up a VPN and have full connectivity back and forth. And that's an easy way to do it. But you don't always have that luxury. So what we're going to talk about today is how to get from here to there when you don't necessarily control what there is or how it's connected. And as I mentioned here, you know, you may be different locations, different security zones. There was a gentleman, and I'm sorry, I forgot his name. He talked about the trouble light on uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, no, Tuesday. And he said, well, we can't actually see the display because we work, we do DOD work. So all we can do is stick a light out in the hallway and it beeps at us to tell us that something's wrong. So I can't solve that problem for you because you got to have someone. I'm saying you need at least some connectivity, but he had a more extreme problem than I'm talking about here today. So sometimes when you're looking at different places, you, you might have different locations, different security zones. You might not own the remote network. And my canonical example of that is suppose you're a service provider and you do computing support for a bunch of different small businesses. And they've just got a network and some goofy router on the, ed the edge of their network. And you may not be able to control that. You just, you're the guy that has to come in and fix the server when it breaks. So you may be interested in what's going on in that network, but you may not control that network. And sometimes you may have unpredictable or unstable links. And one of the problems, one of the times I ran into that, I was working for a big multinational. I'm Canadian, you see. So sometimes if I mention color in here, it'll be C-O-L-O-U-R. So just, just be aware of that. I was working at head office near Toronto. And we had to deal with machines that were in Shanghai. And if I was trying to do SNMP, SNMP queries from Toronto to Shanghai, it just wasn't going to work. Because it would take a little while to get there. And it, SNMP is UDP, so unreliable datagram protocol. So the packet may never get there, and the answer may never get back. So I, I started thinking about these kind of problems when I was there. So unpredictable or unstable links or other things that you may have to deal with. So I wrote this this week. 
And I thought, no, am I really going to cover all these things? I think, I think we are. So I'm going to talk about the remote monitoring situations you may run into, where you want to get from here to there, the things you might want to look at there, F different ways that you can get from here to there or from there to here, so you can get your results. You can get your queries there and you can get your results back. And it all ties into, of course, I built a little thing over the past year or so, which is intended to address some of these problems. And I'll just, and that's how I figured out how, how to solve many of these problems and how I ran into some of these problems. So I'll mention how I dealt with them when I actually implemented this thing that I built. And the network's actually connected on my thing here, so there you go. Life is good. So I was sitting, I, I have a thing and it, it'll talk Wi-Fi, and last night the hotel Wi-Fi was just not cooperating with me, so I have no idea if anything's actually working there or not. So real world examples of the kind of situations we're talking about. As I mentioned, multiple locations, you may have disjoint networks, different people may control it. You may be in a large company and, and you're on the server team and there's a separate network team and maybe you don't necessarily always get along. So if you, get, if you go to the network team and say, I need 12 holes through the firewall, they may kind of give you a dirty look and say, well, I'm not gonna, I can't possibly do that. That's, that's a bad thing. As I mentioned, some networks that won't necessarily pass everything. I mentioned UDP a moment ago. You may have small locations where you really don't want a lot of overhead there. And my example there is if you've, got a, if you've got a chain of retail stores, in each store you may have a manager's PC and you've got a point of sale system, but it, you don't really want to spend all the money to put an entire infrastructure in that store with a, a monitoring server and this and that and the other thing and, and huge network connectivity between here and there. You just want to be able to get enough information out of that location. And again, I mentioned uh, you may have multiple customers where you don't necessarily control their office. And again, they're paying you to keep their server working. They're not necessarily paying you to manage their entire network or spend a lot of money on their behalf. So you may want to do this uh, on the cheap and on the easy. I was going to try and make a joke about being on the cheap and on the easy, but I thought it's too early and I can't put a good, nice, clean joke together at this time of day. So ways you could address these kind of problems where you've got multiple locations. You could, of course, just put a nice Nagios server. Uh, and since we're here at the Nagios conference, it would be a Nagios XI server with full corporate support, of course. You could put one at each location. You could open your firewall completely and say, well, I've got 10 machines in the remote location, so I need to open a firewall port for each of those machines and for each service on that machine that I want to connect to. And, and soon enough, your firewall looks like Swiss cheese or a cheese grater or, or something like that. And that's not always really a practical way to do it. You could, have, you could set up a VPN between locations and just allow all traffic back and forth, or you may allow all traffic just from your monitoring server at your central location out to those machines and sending it back. But you start getting into a, a lot of complications trying to keep track of that. You may run into you know, differences between teams. You're not on the security team. You can't control those things. Or you may not actually want to make those things that wide open because you'd like to maintain some distance between those two locations. And of course, you could use things like Mod Gear Man, which connects two servers back and forth, and they talk, and they share a bunch of data back and forth. But again, you've got, in order to use Gear Man, you'd have to have a server of some kind at the remote location, which may or may not be the approach you want to take. So I mentioned many of these reasons why you might want to do those things. You know, you don't want to spend a lot of money or time maintaining more servers. You may not control that remote location. You may not want to open a big, fat, wide pipe between here and there. Um, you may, of course, be blocked by, we, we all know the seven layer OSI network model, right? But there's the, actually nine layers. There's financial and political are the top two layers. And they're the most difficult to overcome. So you may be blocked by those kinds of things. And you may only care about a subset of devices. There was a gentleman I was talking to you who's right here. He works for Ingress. And you, uh, he mentioned that you know, they install database systems and there's all sorts of other things going on on the network, but really they might just care about the database system and how it works. So you may not want to worry about the entire network um, that you're connecting to. You may only care about a subset of things. For example, you may sell, um, a friend of mine works for um, Agfa Healthcare. They do medical imaging. They sell systems that keep track of all the x-rays and things like that and pass that information back and forth and that sits on a hospital network. And they might want to just be able to keep track of what that imaging machine is doing and send back information about that. 
And of course, this is the situation that I'm usually in, that I've got no influence or power or budget. So I need to do something simple. This is my favorite thing about computer science. And I did a talk on Finagios and Indirection last year. And I've written a bunch of plugins and plugin wrappers where you've got a thing that does something, but if you put another thing around it and indirect through that other thing, you can solve a lot of interesting problems that way. So keep that in mind and, and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to mention a couple ways that we can traditionally approach these problems of connecting from here to there, and just so that we know uh, the kinds of things we can do and how we can uh, approach that. So we're probably at least vaguely familiar with uh, NRPE, the Nagios Remote Plugin Executor or Executor or Runner Thinger. I never know how to pronounce Executor or ex Executor. Um, where you can connect to a particular port on a remote machine and say run one of these, these plugins. When we normally think of that, we think of we're doing local checks on that remote machine. But really, you can configure NRPE to run any command for you. And if you uh, configure it with um, the don't blame Nagios configuration option to let you run arbitrary arguments, and I took my own copy of NRPE and, and changed the code a little bit, so it'll do just about whatever I want it to now. You can cause it to do run arbitrary commands or a subset of possible commands. We normally think of NRPE as doing checks on that local machine, but there's nothing preventing it from doing a check against another machine in that remote location. So essentially, you can use NRPE as a proxy to get from here to there and have the remote machine, or wherever it happens to be, do other probes on that remote network and then pass that information back over that same TCP connection you made to it. So here's a mechanism you can use where you can, if you have some control over the firewall and you want to open a little hole, you could open a tiny hole that goes from your Nagio server over here to the NRPE port over there on the firewall, it goes through to the machine that's running NRPE, and then it can fan out from there and get you information that way. Some might think it's a bad idea to accept arbitrary commands over the network and just run the hell out of them. Um, you can balance it out that way. Um, one thing that may um, mitigate some of that is that NRPE on the remote machine typically runs as the Nagios user, so it can only run certain things. You can do things like have a restricted shell or put it in a Chirrut environment if you're so inclined so that it only has access to certain things. But you, know, you have to balance out whether it makes any sense in your environment. See, I told you, another layer of indirection doing that proxy thing. Uh, the one downside, I, I wasn't sure if I should do this slide first or do the SSH slide first, but we'll see what happens. NRPE is a little more restricted than SSH because we all know that SSH is really a tool to let you do arbitrary things on arbitrary networks no matter what anybody else says. So if you've got an SSH connection, you can do pretty much anything, which is a good thing. Similarly, you can do the same kinds of things with SSH. If you can open a little SSH hole from your local network into a machine on the remote network, you can use check by SSH, or you can write your own wrapper or anything like that to run commands there. Normally, again, we typically think of check by SSH as running checks on that machine that you're SSHing to. But again, it can do a fan out. It can run arbitrary commands for you. You can mitigate what it does um, in the SSH key file that's on the remote side. So typically, you will set, if you're doing check by SSH, you'll set up a, a passphrase less key so that you don't have to give a password every time you connect to the remote machine. And in the key file on the far side that says the authorized hosts, the authorized keys file, in it you can say, you're only allowed to run this command. So where I work at FreshBooks, the fine online invoicing service that allows me to be here today, uh, we have a command called inspect command. And we put that in our SSH key files, and it looks at, and that command is given all the arguments that you pass along with your regular command. You say uh, SSH other host uptime. And if you have a command in the uh, SSH keys file, the authorized keys file on the far side, it will run that command with whatever arguments you gave it. And it also gets an environment variable telling what the original command that you requested was. So we have a little command called inspect command. It looks at the environment it has, what you were really trying to run. It looks at where you're coming from, uh, what machine you're on and says, you're allowed to do that command on this machine. 
So if you allow SSH into the remote side, you don't necessarily have to give it full range access. You can put a wrapper around what it's allowed to do and limit the damage that it can possibly do. And again, just like NRPE, another layer of indirection. And of course you can do terrible, awful things. If you can get to one place, you can hop to another place and then hop to another place. Um, I've done that on various occasions, not for monitoring, but you know, if you have a gateway machine, you'll say, okay, I'm gonna SSH here and, and run SSH there to get through the gateway to the machine I really care about. I'm not sure that this is really a good idea, but you know, SSH is the Swiss Army knife of getting through firewalls, right? So the, a couple more things about SSH. You need to, of course, allow SSH through the firewall, and that works if you, if you can influence what happens on the remote firewall or you can control it. That's not always the case, of course, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the things you can do, uh, I had mentioned that link between Toronto and Shanghai earlier. We could not do SNMP over that. You can, of course, uh, mitigate those kinds of problems where you've got an unreliable link to a remote location. You can use a TCP connection provided by SSH to run check SNMP at the remote end, do your quick little UDP datagrams at the remote end, get the answer back, and it comes back over your nice reliable TCP connection. So you can mitigate the problems of those unreliable or higher latency links. And sometimes you're doing checks and you really want to know um, how quick things are. So we'll typically set up a timeout on our checks, which defaults to 10 seconds, I think, in Nagios. Uh, so you want to do a check SNMP. Tell me about uh, how full is that particular disk. And you want to do that quick SNMP query, get the quick answer back. And you expect it to happen in a small number of seconds. If you've got a, a long latency link or an unreliable link, you may not get a good picture of how long it actually takes to answer that query by going over this link. So if you put your check at the remote end and you check on that local network what the response time is, you may get a more accurate picture of how things are really working there if you do the check locally and send the results back over to your head office or your central monitoring box. Another traditional approach is use passive checks. And I'll be honest with you, I've never been a fan of passive checks, but I've had to do some recently and I've kind of grudgingly come around to, yeah, it's not so bad in some cases. I'm not really crazy about the way you have to end up um, displaying things. If you're not getting a result back from the passive check, really your, your Nagios display can only say to you, I don't know. It can't say, timed out, it's just, I, I haven't heard from this other guy. He told me he'd you know, check in with me from time to time, but I just haven't heard from him, so I don't know. Um, I'm not really crazy about that, but there are lots of situations where that's really the only approach you can take. So with NSCA, so Nagios Service Check Acceptor, if you have a machine in the other location that you can control, that you can configure, you can tell it to run from cron or whatever, or run a shell script periodically, or have something that sits in the background as a daemon, runs a bunch of checks from time to time, sends the results back. Now in order to do that, you have to have a path back from the remote location to your central location, which may or may not be acceptable. Um, sometimes your central location is your higher security place, and the remote locations are the lower security places, so you might not necessarily want to have a path that comes directly back from the remote location into your central location. With uh, passive checks and, NCS and NSCA, you have to do that kind of thing. Um, and of course, this is, that's the same kind of problem, but just a different direction. Um, so if you can make it somebody else's problem, if somebody else controls the remote side, then you can say, well, you have to send me this data, you figure it out. Um, that's one approach that sometimes works, not often though. Mm -mm. And the question about, because you'd have to configure a machine at the remote side, do you have access? And how do you do things like monitor switches and printers? You may have a remote location which has no general purpose computing devices, just network connectivity switches, printers, or, or funny things like that, or probes that you can't actually run software on. So if you were in that situation, you'd have to install a whole new computer over there, which may or may not be a good thing. So now I'm gonna try and give you a few different ways that may be a little bit non-traditional. The uh, SNMP, I told you before about SNMP's unreliable datagrams over a link, and you may not get the packet back and forth, but sometimes you can actually get the SNMP back and forth. 
the most Unix machines these days run the SNMP daemon from the NetSNMP distribution. You can give that a configuration file, tell it what you want to know, what sort of passwords you need to get access to the SNMP information, those kinds of things. One of the things you can tell it is, if I ask for a particular SNMP OID, run this arbitrary command using the exec settings in SNMP. Um, let me just step aside for a moment. When I talk about um, monitoring in Nagios, I start off with a religion. And one of my religious points is, I think SNMP is a good thing. Not everybody agrees. My argument is that if you have network devices, you're probably talking SNMP in some way anyway. It probably has to be allowed over your network in at least some situations. You may as well use it for as many things as you can. So instead of SSHing to a remote, to a remote machine to run a local check, I will typically set up SNMP to do an SNMP query that runs the command there and gives me the results back. I figure because I'm already using SNMP to get disk information or network uh, utilization information and things like that, use it for everything. So the important thing, again, that the SNMP daemon that's running on a particular machine, it can run an arbitrary command for you if you configure it that way. But that command doesn't have to actually check the local machine. It can, of course, like NRPE or SSH, check some other machine in the local area. And of course, it could do an SNMP check, or it could do a check by SSH or NRPE. It could do any arbitrary number of things and give you an, uh, a path from various machines through a, a twisted maze and get to the location you really care about. The, the downside here is that when you do an SNMP query, you're just saying, give me this answer. And you can't say, give me this answer with these arguments. SNMP doesn't give you an easy way to to say, hey, here's all the arguments I want you to run with this command. It just says, do this thing, do one thing for me. Uh, you need to be able to configure the remote machine, which you may or may not have access to, of course. And of course, you know, it's UDP, unreliable datagram protocol. And probably it's not the first thing you're going to allow through your firewall. But there may be some situations where this kind of approach makes sense. Especially if you're network guys, you've got a server team and a network team, and the network guys allow all the SNMP through because they like to use SNMP to to maintain all their machines, you can just piggyback on what they're already doing and say, well, if it's okay for you guys, then it must be okay. So, web pages. And it took me, took me about seven or eight years to twig to this idea. And I finally figured it out about two years ago that, oh yeah, web servers. They run things like CGI scripts and PHP scripts. And I've already got firewall rules that allow port 80 in from anywhere. I could, oh, I could do that. So you can set up, if you've got a web server running, say, Apache or Nginx or whatever, you could set up a secret page, a secret page that no one will ever figure out about. And that page can run commands for you or give you status information. So for example, and, and you can set up rules in your web server to say, only allow this query if it's coming from this particular location. So for example, I mentioned earlier that I work for FreshBooks, fine online invoicing service. And we have an, our office in Toronto, we have our Computers are actually in a data center in Chicago. We have another data center in Virginia. We need to be able to get some status information out. One of the ways we do it is we run a Nagios server in each data center. But we also want to get some information in, in other particular ways. And we have a couple of secret web pages set up that allow access from our office. We'll connect to that web page, and it'll give us status information about uh, how certain things are working one way or another. We can, and we can do regular expression matches on that uh, web page using the, uh, the dash R option to check HTTP, look for a string or look for a regular expression, and it can give us the information back. And of course, uh, now we saw the thing where if you're going to do SSH, you have to control the remote machine. If you're going to do SNMP, you have to control the remote machine. If you're going to do web stuff, you have to be able to get something into the website, which may or may not work um, in various places. <laughs> And of course, it's another proxy, another layer of indirection. And, um, and you can cause it to do pretty much arbitrary things. Because PHP, if it's a CGI script, it's just a command running somewhere. It may be in a Cheroot environment, but you know, that's only a Cheroot environment. And PHP, there may be uh, the security settings for PHP that don't allow you to access files outside a certain directory. But you know, it's just put a shell script in there that you can run, and then the shell script can do anything for you if you want. Um, and as I was typing this up this week, actually, no, I, I made these slides about 
five weeks. I, I, yeah, I had these prepared well in advance. But as I was looking, thinking of this last night, it, oh, it occurred to me that it's not just web protocols that you can subvert to your will. SMTP is another protocol that's often allowed through firewalls. And I want to send you a mail message. You could easily have something set up on the remote end that gets a mail message, runs a command against it, or runs proc mail or things like that. Looks at who the mess message is from, looks for a secret code inside it, or maybe it's signed with a PHP signature or, or whatever. You could have it do arbitrary things for you and then mail the results back. So even if you don't necessarily have a real-time uh, connection from here to there, if you can send a message through somehow, you can get information back out. It, but again, you need to control some machine that's on the remote side, which may or may not work for you. I used to do some stuff with asterisk telephone systems. One of the things asterisk allows you to do is as you're setting up your call plan, your dial plan in asterisk, you can set up an extension that if you call that extension, it'll do arbitrary things for you. It can run an arbitrary Unix command for you. So you, and I had a thing, a number of years ago, a, a company had a, a, a conference bridge. They wanted to make sure the conference bridge worked. So I set up a thing that dialed in from one location to the conference bridge, pressed a couple of DTMF touch tone tones to get a particular extension, and that extension had a shell script that ran that created a file on the remote machine. And then there was a thing on the remote machine that looked for that file and made sure it was recent and then reported that back to the monitoring server. So the point is, if you've got a PBX and telephones at the remote location, you could make those telephones do checks for you. Now, this is maybe one of the less practical approaches, but as I said, you know, I, I never claimed it was a really good idea, but you could do that. And you could, have, you could even have the remote machine, I, I told you you could send mail and have it send mail back to you. Well, you can make a phone call and then have it phone you back. And um, as uh, uh, Dave, Dave Williams, I think it was, who talked about the all-in-one asterisk visual thing the other day, he said he, he included in there uh, text-to-speech that asterisk can do. So you can actually make a phone call and have asterisk call you back and leave you voicemail saying, oh, by the way, everything is hunky-dory, so, if you're so inclined. I said earlier, not so crazy about passive checks, but it's kind of okay. Uh, we mentioned N NSCA earlier, having the passive checks come back. And I'm just gonna mention, um, and I think we covered most of this. Uh, we had talked about it in the, in the uh, the situation of using NSCA, the Nagios service check acceptor, to send the information back to your central Nagios box. But given that you can control a, rem a machine on the remote location, cause it to run commands from cron or whatever, and send that information back to you, you, you don't have to use NSCA to send it back. You can use NRDP, of course, which is much better than NSCA. Or it can SSH back to you, or it can send you mail, or it can make phone calls, or do web calls back into your central location. So if you have some way of causing commands to run on the remote side, you can use any number of methods, pretty much all these same methods I just mentioned of going that way, you can use those same methods to come back this way. So let's assume that you've figured out a way to get from here to there and cause commands to run. Now, some of us, um, are GUI inclined, we like to use wonderful tools like Nagios XI, supported by our wonderful friends here at Nagios and well worth the price. Uh, and with a, a more GUI oriented interface, using tools like Nagios QL, um, there's actually another talk that I think is happening at the same time right now that you're missing out on, on Adagios, which is a, a Python based web interface for managing your config files and things like that. So there's various um, pointy clicky ways of managing your config files that you can use. And some of us, I'm an old time Unix guy, I create config files by hand, cat into file name, and, and do things like that. Um, but you need to, you've got your configuration files for Nagios, you're doing your monitoring. You need to tell those configuration files that you need to do some checks by doing this other mechanism. So you need to divert those checks through this funny tunnel that you've created. Now you could set up those checks specifically to do those things. So you say, okay, if I'm checking the, the file server that's in Chicago 
then I know I have to do this funny SNMP query. So in your Nagios config file, you write uh, this new command definition, and you say, okay, uh, the, the Chicago server check, and then you do this and this, and you write down this big long command inside your Nagios configs. And then the next day you say, I need to add another check on that same server. And you have to copy the same crap to an, another iteration of things like that. So, and, and I had mentioned earlier that I was building this little, this little toy right here, built on an as, an, a Raspberry Pi. And I was thinking about that same kind of problem. How do I fit this nicely into my existing configs? And so what I did was I wrote a little script and I talked about this last year called MB Divert. And it's available on Nagios Exchange or at my site um, in the links. There's pointers to that. But what MB Divert does, it's a wrapper, another level of indirection around existing plugins. And what you do with MB Divert is you say, MB Divert, check HTTP dash H, the host you care about, and all the other arguments you may give it, or any other plugin. MB Divert looks at the command line it's given which includes the plugin you actually want to run, figures out what host that, uh, that check is directed to, looks at the MB Divert configuration file and says, oh, you're checking a host that's in Chicago. I have a special rule for getting to Chicago. So underneath the covers, MB Divert will do your funky SNMP check or, do a, or go through SSH or NRPE or things like that. And cause that command to run in the remote location, get, give you the results back, and do the right thing. And uh, a real life example of that at FreshBooks, fine online invoicing service, we, um, we have some web servers for our public website that live on Linodes and uh, on dedicated servers outside of our regular data center. The idea being that if one thing falls down, not everything will fall down, so we haven't lost everything. And these are standalone web servers we don't have a firewall in front of them. So we don't have a VPN between our office where we do the monitoring and the remote web server. So we do checks by going in, SSH in, run the checks on those remote servers and give the answers back. We configure them the exact same way as every other server. We just have MB Divert set up as a wrapper around almost all of our uh, check calls, our, our plugin calls, and it just says, okay, if I'm looking at the machine that happens to be in Dallas, then do a check by SSH and go over there. And that way, the configuration for all of our machines looks all the same, except MB Divert diverts some of those checks and take, sends them through a different path. And that seems to, from my point of view, it, it works out fairly well. Now, an interesting thing about MB Divert, the way I wrote it, is, uh, you know, in Unix land, uh, when you run a program, it can look at the name it was called by in argv0 or $0 if it's a shell script and things like that. You can have symbolic links to a program, and so a program can actually have multiple names. And I built MB Divert so that MB Divert will look at the name it was called by, and if that's not MB Divert, it will assume that that's the plugin you actually want to write, you actually want to run. So what you can do is if you want to use MB Divert and you have an existing mechanism or a set of configuration files, if you go to your local plugins directory on your Nagio server, replace that directory full of real plugins with a directory full of links to MB Divert with the same names as the plugins, then all of a sudden Nagios is running MB Divert underneath the covers and you have not had to change your configuration at all in your Nagios configs. And that can be a winner for some people. There's also uh, in the Nagios resource config file, there's a variable user1, and by convention, that is the directory where your plugins are stored. And normally, something like user lib Nagios plugins or whatever. And what Nagios does when it's running, and all your command definitions are set up so that uh, to re refer to the plugin, it says $user1 slash plugin name. That's just a string being substituted in. By convention, it's a directory. That string could easily be a whole other command line that prefaces your command. So you can cause MB Divert to run against all of your plugins by simply changing your user one variable in your resource config file to invoke MB Divert and give it the regular plugin invocation after that. So I built this thing so that if you need to get, you know, take funny paths to get to certain places, you can do it without being very disruptive 
to what you're currently doing. And I thought that was probably a, a good approach to do it. Change what happens with barely a config change. And of course, this is, it's on Nagios Exchange, and, and I built it to work with my little box, but I think it has general applicability as well. I was here last year, and one of the things Ethan talked about was the Nagios Reflector Service, which I thought was a kind of a cool idea. And what the reflector did was um, you got two locations. You got a machine over here that runs a check, needs to report back to your Nagios server over here, but you got firewalls in the middle. And so what Nagios Reflector does is it uses NRDP, which by default uses regular SSL connections and XML and things like that. Reflector says, I've got a server up here that everybody can access. And I've got an SSL encrypted connection, and I've got a secret token. So the machine over here that runs a check, it can send the results to the web server up here and say, I, I checked my disk. My disk is 80% full. And here's my secret key, so you know it's me actually telling you. This machine up here stores it. Your Nagio server down here connects to this machine using HTTPS which is almost certainly allowed of your, out of your firewall, gives the secret token and says, have you got any information for me about the disk over in that other location? And it says, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Uh, this guy told me about it, and he told me about it 10 seconds ago, so your check's fairly fresh, and you get the information back here, and you put it in your Nagios box. So you guys can't see it, but he's back there. He says, 15 minutes. I feel like I'm at a football game or something. It's great. Um, so you can use Reflector to get from here to there by using a trusted third party. Um, so that's another way. Instead of going direct from this location to your remote location, you can use a trusted third party to get you that information. And I thought that was a pretty cool idea, and, uh, and I stole it. So, but I, 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 it, it's not really stealing if you say where you got the thing from. And when I do talk, I'm doing a talk at the Lisa System Administration Conference in November in Washington, D.C. Fabulous place to go, as a matter of fact. Um, it's near the zoo. Um, and I've got some nice diagrams. You'll notice today's slides, no diagrams. I'm not real good at making pictures. And I was going to make a diagram of this, this thing, but I figured I'd hand waving as much quicker. I have some diagrams. I stole those diagrams from Ethan. And you know, it shows how Nagios works. But I figure I stole them, but I just put his name down at the bottom, so everything's OK. Um, so, you can, so I stole his idea about the reflector service. Actually, I think it was Scott's idea about the reflector service. I was talking to Scott last night, and he was saying, yeah, I just knocked it together. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a thing, right? Um, the, the advantage about this is you don't need any inbound firewall rules, because almost certainly every location lets you do HTTPS out, um, already allowed. Um, the problem is you still need to configure that remote machine somehow, which may or may not be a possibility for you. And I said earlier, it may not make sense to put a complete Nagio server in the remote location. But in some circumstances, it may make sense. Um, there's another talk right now, next door. Paul Weber, and I believe he's talking about using a Raspberry Pi as an Agios box. And so he might say, well, just put a Raspberry Pi there, and that solves your problem. So that may work for some people. Um, so with reflection, you could have a full Nagios server in the remote location that just ships all its information out. You know in the traditional Nagios way of doing distributed, um, distributed monitoring, where you set up one master server that knows everything, and you say, and for this selection of uh, checks, don't actually run those checks. Expect passive results. And you ship part of your configuration off to another Nagio server. And then it uses um, send NSCA to send the results back to the master server. That's the traditional way of doing it. You can do the equivalent thing, but you can send those results back through a reflector service if you were so inclined. So if you've got a server over there that can do everything, it can send it, all its results back and, and let you know. Uh, an alternative to that is, I wrote a thing a whole bunch of years ago where we had multiple Nagio servers. I wrote a plugin that it went to that one Nagio server and just got the tactical overview page and gave a result back that said, I've got three things broken, I've got 200 things that are OK, and displayed it on my central box. And then you could click through and, and go over there. So the information you send back could be a summary Instead of sending, if you're doing 200 checks on the remote location, it could just send a summary back of what's currently broken or that everything's OK. So you can actually do that with essentially one check if you were so inclined, if it made sense. Um, 
So if you've got another Nagios server out there, you can do the reflection thing. If you can get access to it, if you can open a hole through the firewall, you can use tools like Nagios Fusion or Thruk and MK Live Status to get the information back and forth and aggregate that information at your central location so that you're not actually doing uh, single checks from here to there. And you're doing a full set of checks over there and getting all the results back. But this, of course, not a lightweight approach. And earlier on in this talk, I said, you know, suppose you don't want to spend all the money and put a server over there, or you don't actually control the firewall. Some cases, this may work. Some cases, it may not work. So I gave you a bunch of examples, and I said, you got to put a machine over there, and you got to give it configuration. And one of the typical ways we'll do that is we'll SCP or rsync some configuration into that machine. We'll SSH in, and we'll you know, sign on to it. An alternative is, you know, we just talked about the reflector service where you've got a machine over there that sends results back through the trusted third party. You could have that trusted third party give instructions to that remote machine. So you could have a little cron job running on that remote machine that every 15 minutes or half hour connects to your trusted third party or back to your central location if possible and says, what should I do? Give me my configuration. So using the kind of reflector model where you've got the trusted third party, you don't just have to pass uh, plug-in information through that remote location, plug-in results back. You could potentially give it, here's everything I want you to check. Here's all the configuration information. The machine in the remote location gets that configuration every once in a while and then acts on that configuration. So you don't necessarily have to have a path into that remote location to cause it to uh, configure itself or update its configuration. Now, of course, you still have to put a machine there in the first place, but you don't necessarily have to have an ongoing connection into that location. <laughs> and of course, so I mentioned, I, I set up this whole premise at the start that you may not have access in there, and then I said, well, put a machine in there. And that kind of puts the lie to my whole premise here. So that's basically the ideas that I've come up with on how to get to remote locations. Some of them are fairly straightforward and well documented and have been around for many years using standard NRPE or things like that. But I hope I've given you some ideas on how you can um, take existing tools and subvert them to your will by using you know, a third party proxy, for example, or tunneling through some mechanism and spreading out a little wider on the far end. And I gave you some examples as we went through of places where I've actually used a number of these things. Um, and so I think they're reasonably practical in some ways. It may look, um, some of the things I do at work, I come up with a really clever idea and I implement it. And of course I document it and put comments in. But it's not always the most straightforward approach to solving a problem. And sometimes in our environments, we like to have clever things, and sometimes we don't really like to have clever things because, you know, three years from now, the guy that comes into work after I've won the lottery and, and quit suddenly will be really confused. So you've got to balance out um, the, the practical with the understandability and things like that. Um, so, and if you'll give me just a moment, I'll, I'll just mention how I used some of these ideas in the little thing that I built. Um, so just very quickly, I, I wanted to be able to get into remote locations. And the situation I came up with a, a few years ago, I was working at a large multinational in a central computing group. We managed a bunch of central VMware servers. We managed the mail infrastructure, which was Lotus Notes. Ugh. It was horrible, but you know, not as bad as Exchange, of course. Um, and we do, did the management of all the firewalls at the different locations. So we had head office and there was like 500 different locations and we managed the firewalls there. And I thought, well, we don't actually look at the network behind the firewall. It might be nice to be able to prove that if you're behind the firewall, you can actually get out. So I thought, well, what if you put something back there that was really lightweight? I mean, we already shipped them a firewall. What if we shipped them something else? So I came up with the idea of having a little tiny device that you could ship out and do and do various tasks for you. And then a year or so ago, well, a year and a half ago, when the Raspberry Pi came out, I said, okay, there's something really nice and cheap. So I built this little thing on top of the Raspberry Pi to do remote locations. 
And the way I built it was, remember I told you about a trusted third party. I stole the reflector idea from Ethan and Scott. I set up a management server. And the management server knows about all the different Raspberry Pis. The Raspberry Pi, you plug it in. It's got a, a flash card loaded with my software on it. It connects to the management server and says, by the way, what would you like me to do? Downloads cron jobs or Nagios configuration fragments and runs those. And then it either reports back to, directly to a Nagios server if it can do that or uses a reflector-like service to send results back that way. And my experience thus far is that, that it works fairly well, um, that I can take these de this device, I can have a Nagios server. Um, what's a particular example? Mo most of the stuff that I have set up for testing is sitting in my house in the basement. But I, I've got various devices at various locations, and I've sold a few um, where you, you do an HTTPS connection out to the management server, report results back, and then your Nagios server can go and get it. So that, that, that's my example of it seems to work using that trusted third party to uh, get configuration information and pass information back. And of course, if you can connect to the remote box, it also will act as a proxy. So if, if you are able to SSH into it or SNMP into it, you can cause it to do other things and spread it in proxy and do other uh, questions. And of course, you can configure it. And I set it all up with an API so that you can, in theory, tie this into your existing configurations using things like MB Divert uh, and things like that. Dun, dun, dun. And of course, I would be delighted to tell you more if you're curious. And we are at 9.45 with five minutes left to go. And now I will open the floor to questions about remote access. Or if you have other problems that you have solved that are on a similar topic, please feel free to say this is how you approach it. Or if I've said something that is a pile of crap, you're, you're welcome to say, you know, John, I'm not sure I agree with you on that point. Any questions? Or is it too early in the morning? Scott has a question. I actually don't have a question as much as a comment. It's actually flattering that you've uh, kind of reworked the reflector. Um, it was something that we put together last year as uh, more of a proof of concept. And we just whipped it up real quick. Like, like you said, it, it was uh, more of an afternoon project. But uh, it kind of got shuffled low priority. And, um, and initially, we uh, after the talk last year, we had some requests to package that together. And, Seeing what you've done and, and, and the work on this, I think I actually might have to bump the priority a little bit to make a package or a VM that somebody could just use it, uh, in their internal networks. Because one of, the, um, one of the problems that was brought up at last year's talk was with the hosted service, even though we were providing free, obviously nobody or not everybody's willing to send their data to a hosted service. So exactly. So we may end up packaging something together to act as a reflector for people as well, because I think it is useful, even if the reflector um, server, VM, whatever, is running within someone else, someone's infrastructure. So that may be coming in the future, too. Yeah, and as you know, I've given you these various examples of how you can use a trusted third party. And as Scott points out, the, the third party doesn't necessarily have to be somebody else. It can be a, a server that you can control whether it's at a convenient place on your interior network or um, you know, a nice secure location at a colo somewhere that everybody can access and things like that. Um, and and e even if you don't want to wait for Scott and Ethan and Nagios Enterprises to package up the reflector service, I, I grabbed, I re-implemented it myself by looking at Scott's check reflector uh, script that runs on your Nagios server to get that information. And I said, okay, we got some XML. And I signed up for a free account on the Nagios Reflector. And so I could send it something and get some stuff back. So I re-implemented what they had done. And it was fairly straightforward. And of course, you can make up your own mechanism for doing the same kind of thing. But you may as well you know, piggyback on what they've already done, if you're so inclined. Any other uh, comments or questions for John? Probably more of a comment um, when it is possible to use a Nagios uh, at the remote site. Uh, we do actually expose the console to the customers out there, and they get a very comfortable, cozy feeling by having the status information available to them, even though it's not their maybe entire IT infrastructure. Um, but right now, we just have remote hacks to bring it back to our central server and it's always good to see 
ideas on getting that done better. Yeah, but and I, th I think your point about letting the customer see that you know what you're actually doing on the network is probably something that gives people a lot of you know, nice, warm, fuzzy feelings. They can trust you completely, but to actually see it working. Um, one of the nice things that I've always observed about Nagios, because uh, with contact groups and the CGI permissions and things like that, if you do have customers and you wanted to expose your internal master Nagios server, you can show them the subset that's right there. So whether you have it, uh, a Nagios server that's sitting on their network that they go to, or showing them a subset of your master service, um, I think that's, as you say, it's a very good thing to do, I would agree. Okay, it is break time. Thank you very much for coming, and enjoy the rest of the day.